Thank Calliope that human beings are such existentially fragile meat sleeves, otherwise we'd probably get tired of all these games about time anomalies and their implications on our mortality. Anyway, Everhood stars an armless wooden doll, dismissively referred to as Red. Red's journey to get their arm back involves a lot of people just attacking them for really petty reasons. VIP access, bureaucracy, or just because they're evil. But in the Eartha Kit way, that's actually just kind of endearing. Each fight plays out in a bullet hell rhythm game where Red dodges the songs being played at them. The realm of Everhood and its inhabitants defy any concrete understanding. It's an odd world, and everyone in it has this inexplicable vibe that could be described as emphatic aimlessness. They're happily doing their own random things, even if it seemingly amounts to nothing. As such, Red's own incompleteness is mirrored in their seemingly nonsensical interactions with the world. Their dismantled body reflects their alienation, the fact that they can't quite see the whole picture. Maybe someone wanted it that way. After a time, Red finds out that everyone around them is immortal. Apparently, several powerful mages discovered the secret to everlasting life, and then they granted it to everyone in Everhood. So long as no one can kill you, you can never die. This kind of explains why all the creatures you meet are so one dimension- I mean, uh, unsettling in their simplicity. The passing of millennia has sanded everyone down to their core characteristics. Without anyone new to meet or any reason to change who they are, each character feels entrenched in their idiosyncrasies. <coughs> Okay, fine. I'll stop being pretentious. I guess the real reason everyone's like this is because Everhood really wants to emulate the humor of Undertale. It actually wants to emulate a lot about Undertale, and I don't think that's a bad thing. Toby Fox doesn't have a monopoly on Earthbound-inspired JRPGs with bullet hell combat, quirky characters, and an energetic soundtrack. On top of that, Undertale and Everhood explore different ideas. Undertale is broadly about how people connect with fiction, while Everhood is about... an ineffable tale of the inexpressible divine moments of truth. Basically, I don't think the comparison is meant as a put-down because Everhood plays like it's in conversation with Undertale. It wants to investigate the latter's themes from a new perspective. The world of Everhood feels like what would happen if someone played Undertale over and over again. Never letting the monsters move on, never finding anything better to do, racked with a perverted sentimentality. A hundred thousand iterations on the same story as each new beginning strips the world and its inhabitants of their vitality. And that's kind of the point to Undertale. To complete the extermination route, the player would have to be so obsessed with the raw mechanics that they completely ignore the characters, narrative, and ideas. This was why the monsters feared the humans for their determination. Just as it drove humanity's capacity for good, determination also fueled their worst desires. By wringing every last scrap of novel content from Undertale, the player caused its world irreparable damage. Everhood examines this player-game relationship and reaches a different conclusion. But before I dig deeper into that analysis, I need to drop an absolute truth on everyone. The worst part about playing Undertale is having to play Undertale. I'm sorry. Everything good about Undertale is in the writing, the characters, the humor, the soundtrack, and the brilliant Ludo narrative. The turn-based bullet hell combat is most interesting when it characterizes a new, plot-relevant monster. I only need to be good enough to get more story. The second it gives me more than one random encounter, or a challenge for challenge's sake, it loses me. Everhood doesn't have this problem because it's a blast to play. The rhythm bullet hell may not have the same capacity to express each character's individuality, but the visual flair and high intensity keep the fun factor going long after I've exhausted my dictionary of swear words. And that's because Everhood is really tough. The difficulty menu says that hard gives you a sense of accomplishment? That's horseshit. 
You can play on normal or even easy and still feel like you've ridden a whirlwind of pain. Despite its difficulty, you're encouraged to stick around just to see what kind of visual nonsense comes next. For a game that already has a unique mode of interaction, deconstructing rhythm instead of matching it, Everhood still likes to play with its presentation. In addition to the vibrant imagery of each fight, the rhythm track itself can become warped and shifted, providing both added challenge and an unsettling awareness of the powers beyond your comprehension. It's enough to get carried away in the sheer intensity of it all as you survive a dazzling array of musical violence. Plus, you can have go-kart races with the other monsters. And just when you think you've seen everything the game has to offer, Red gets their arm back, and with it, the ability to kill. The frog you first encountered at the start now tells you to kill everyone in Everhood. By ending their lives, you're freeing them from the prison of their immortality. That is, if you think the frog is being truthful, and not just telling you what you need to hear to get you to think that killing is justified. To kill, Red must deflect two attacks of the same color, and then launch the accumulated energy back at the target. The switch to a more aggressive playstyle changes how the player perceives the battle. For one, bosses that were very difficult without my arm were trivialized by the deflectability. At the same time, by virtue of how involved Red's counterattacks are, they are continuously making the decision to end a character's life, each deflection adding to the weight of their culpability. From this point forward, the consequences of your actions are a mystery, and the ethics get highly questionable. Each character greets death differently. Some are resigned to it, others are opposed, but many just don't know how to react. They haven't needed to think about death for a while, so they don't fully understand the implication until it's far too late. I gotta be honest, I didn't really want to keep playing after I got my arm back. None of the characters gave me a reason to kill them, especially since most turned out to be really chill once I got to know them. But the frog's insistence that I was freeing them from a stagnant and torturous existence became surprisingly reassuring, enough to where I could finish the game. And boy was it a trip. Pretty serious spoilers from here on out. So if you couldn't tell by now, this game's final act draws a lot of its ideological momentum from a sort of stripped down version of Buddhist principles. On top of having an actual bodhisattva appear during a few different fights, Red also receives absolute truths in these kaleidoscopic spaces. The circular shape and brilliant colors are reminiscent of the mandala, a metaphysical space for deep Buddhist meditation, where worshippers can even commune with a Buddha. I covered the subject in more detail for my video on Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, but here's a brief reminder. Central to Buddhist belief is the cyclical nature of the soul. The bodies it inhabits live, die, and are reborn as each reincarnation presents a new opportunity to reach nirvana, a state of eternal, spiritual enlightenment. Anathema to this pursuit of nirvana are our earthly connections. Possessions, wealth, and human urges tie the soul to a mortal body resulting in a spiritual stagnation. Thus, immortality deprives the soul of its chance to be reborn, as a perpetual life prolongs the innate suffering of existence. I'm not a monk or a Buddhist scholar, but this should be sufficient for understanding Everhood. Once Red claims the last soul in Everhood, their true nature is revealed. Red is actually the vessel for Pink. Wow, are the developers Steven Universe fans too? A human mage trying to break the curse of their immortality. They've apparently made this attempt several times before, paralyzed by everlasting life, yet too afraid of death to truly move on. This conflict of emotions left Pink in their own spiritual stagnation, unable to live, yet unwilling to die. Instead, Pink acts through Red, hoping that learning to kill through the doll would make death more approachable for themselves. Depending on how one interprets Pink's actions, they may still not be taking responsibility for their desires. But as the player gets put fully in control of Pink, they begin a long and exhausting journey to a completely uncertain conclusion. I had done so much. 
worked so hard to get to this point, and good or bad, all I know is that this battle is where I face the end of everything. The visuals erupt with a heavenly glow, eroding my uncertainty with each desperate and demanding fight. I needed all my conviction to reach the end, and Everhood really sells the transcendent nature of Pink's final act. Then it all stops. The curse of immortality is broken, and all of Pink's friends are there with them in the waiting room before the next life. They each thank Pink for freeing them from the Everhood, allowing their souls to take the next step into a new future. Some even apologize for the hassle they caused getting there. The uncertainty of Pink's actions left them feeling pretty fearful. With each goodbye, the player gets several more reassurances that they did the right thing. I have mixed feelings about this ending. I think the core text of Everhood is important. The fear of death shouldn't cause people to live harmful or toxic lives. Our minds and our emotional health are not suited to eternity and shouldn't be burdened by never-ending life. Therefore, the life we lead should be viewed as the beautiful tapestry of all our decisions, with the understanding that even the bad choices left us poised to make better ones later. Human life is not cheapened by its finality, but rather tarnished by an obsession with longevity. Greed, selfishness, and cruelty come as a result of prolonging one's own life at the expense of others. This ending also serves as an interesting response to Undertale. Undertale essentially asks players to stop playing, to be satisfied with a happy ending. Even when they know there's a whole other game's worth of new content available for those willing to kill. It's a reminder that enjoying media, especially in the modern age of fandoms and fan wikis, doesn't require all-consuming devotion. By contrast, Everhood reaffirms the value of a more comprehensive enjoyment, epitomizing the unique satisfaction of struggling for the game's true ending, a feat that can often take more than one playthrough. But when I think about the subtext for more than a second, it really bothers me how Pink has forced a supposedly spiritual awakening onto everyone in Everhood. Congrats to them that, as a function of the writing, it all worked out in the end, but when stripped of the context-specific set dressing, we're left with a game about killing 30 creatures because the hero just decided that their friends weren't able to appreciate their lives anymore. I feel like this should go without saying, but you can't make someone enlightened through violence. Buddha can tell when you do that, you know. Put simply, it feels wrong to decide for someone that their life isn't worth living, and then disguise that antipathy in appropriated spiritual language. Just because Pink is having an existential crisis, it doesn't mean that they can project that angst onto their friends, many of whom aren't nearly as bothered by their everlasting life. They're just chilling in dance clubs, playing D&D, and taking shrooms in the forest. If that's grounds for execution, then gamers should really start sleeping with one eye open. Plus, is the musical component of the gameplay not evidence that these characters might actually be living exciting lives? Are they making such interesting music and also deeply miserable? I don't know, and I don't think Pink cared. They seem more interested in what they were feeling and what the mystical frog was telling them. Is Pink committing a series of benevolent mercy killings? Or are they just a bullheaded serial killer who thinks they're right and aren't interested in any opinions to the contrary? Sadly, I don't think the game is willing to commit to an answer. The final absolute truth is that there are no absolute truths, and that anything approximating one is actually just a collection of half-truths you've wrapped together. That's supposedly the beauty of life. 
considering all the people I killed to complete the game, this feels like a cop-out. It's another in a long line of disarming reassurances that the things I've seen and the things I've done are totally fine and good. All my friends are basically in heaven now, so who cares how I got them there? The banjo frog, the gnomes, and the developers think I've done the right thing, so don't worry about it. It's whatever. Undertale's extermination route was confrontational because it laid bare the consequences of your actions and allowed its world to react accordingly to the terrible things you did. Everhood has to keep reassuring you that you're doing the right thing. Because the second I stopped taking it at face value, it just felt like Pink annihilated all of existence because it made them feel better about their own ennui. Their dread became Everhood's problem. Is this an uncharitable read of the story? Probably. But when left to parse my own collection of half-truths, this is where I've ended up. I came down on Everhood pretty hard in the end, but it's not a bad game. The core gameplay itself is still incredibly fun, and the soundtrack has been on regular rotation in my Spotify streams. And yeah, that final battle with the universe is one of the most affecting finales in gaming, even if I think it falls short on a narrative level. Everhood is ultimately best when you treat the entire experience as a metaphor, fully submitting yourself to the abstraction and letting the game take you where it wants. Put up any resistance and the experience weakens significantly. Be like Pink and just let the dolls do their thing.